Hello, friends. You're on the Insecurity Project podcast with Jamin. Today, I have the great privilege of interviewing David Neagle. David is the founder of the multi million dollar global coaching company, Life Is Now Inc. Uh, and you've been in this game for over 20 years, David. So uh, I'm, I'm so stoked that you would be willing to be interviewed today. And I'm really looking forward to a very rich conversation. So uh, can you take us back to, to where it started? I'm always fascinated by backstory because I think so often people get stuck in their backstory as a reason why they can't succeed. So I love hearing examples of people who've overcome some stuff and worked through to be where they are. So can you tell us what it was like growing up in your family and, and the role your parents played in shaping your beliefs about yourself and your sense of security and who you were? Yeah, absolutely. Love to. Um, so I was born in, uh, in the mid sixties, 1966. And for the first four years of my life, my memory is that everything was relatively good, uh, at that point. And I had uh, two little playmates, uh, they were cousins of mine. One was a year older than me. One was a year younger than me. And in, I, we, we, we lived in Chicago and, um, and everything was good. And then something happened around 1970 that I didn't realize happened at the time because my parents were kind of sheltering me from the incident. But uh, my mother's brother, who was the father of these two boys, um, him and the two boys died in a house fire and they were just gone. So they were there in my life. We were all very close. And then the, these three people were gone uh, out of my life. After that happened, I progressively was experiencing the collapse of my entire family. So it was my, it was my grandparents, uh, it was me, my mom, my father, uh, my brother who was born in 1970. And things were slowly starting to deteriorate. Plus you had all of the, the global things that were happening, all the global dysfunction that was going on at, at that time, coming off of the assassination in the United States of uh, uh, President Kennedy, and then we had Martin Luther King that was assassinated, and we had the Vietnam War. Um, there was a lot that was going on, and a lot that we were exposed to on the television, and then, of course, in family and social conversation, what we were being exposed to in school. It was also a very interesting time when it came to um, the, the world was changing uh, the idea of how we viewed race. So, in the States, we had television shows that were geared towards children like Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, The Electric Company, and they were, they were very much integrating the idea of, of, of an integrated society, making it, letting white people basically know that people of color were great people, that were good people. As a child, I wasn't sure why we were seeing this, but what I was sure of was that I had a decent amount of racism that I was exposed to as a child in Chicago and some in my family, but I'm getting to see the other side of this. So why am I telling you all this? Because I started to question why there was so much misery in the world. I was raised Catholic. Uh, I, went to, I went to church on a pretty regular basis. I had to do my religious studies uh, once a week. I went through all the sacraments that the, the Catholic religion requires one to go through if you're going to be a Catholic and get married in the, in the Catholic Church. And I'm, you're being taught that you, we come from a loving God. So I'm hearing this on one hand, and yet I'm experiencing so much misery that's coming to me in different educational resources that we're exposed to. So the question in my mind was why is this and what is actually the truth? When I would ask uh, teachers about it, if I would ask my parents about it, if I would ask uh, religious leaders about it that I, was, that I was involved with at the time, nobody could give me an answer. And in actually, in some cases, I was reprimanded because they thought that I was actually causing a disturbance in the classroom by asking questions that they couldn't give an answer to. In other words, in some way, they felt that I was like embarrassing them in front of uh, the other students. So I kind of left it alone, but it never left my curiosity. My parents got divorced when I was 13. Uh, I was kind of raised on the streets of Chicago by myself. My mother was very absent. My father moved to Arizona. And I find myself going through life 
very much unguided, no real parental direction, no correction, no discipline. And I quit high school at 17 years old. I get married very young and have two children. And I find myself in a situation where I have all this responsibility and I have no way to fulfill it because I don't have an education. I really don't have a skill. I could drive a truck and I could drive a forklift. I'm working for a, a food distributor and uh, working six and a half days a week, all the overtime that I can possibly manage. And my wife and I can't pay the bills. We go bankrupt. We have our car repossessed. We have to leave an apartment in the middle of the night with the two babies because we can't afford to live in that place anymore. We have to move about 60 miles away. And I'm starting to really ask the question, how do I change this? Because I'm recognizing the consequence of my choice to quit school, to not get an education, to, to not be a disciplined person, uh, this type of thing. And the more I ask the question, the more I'm not getting any answers that are giving me any direction that I can literally take action on. So it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. My attitude, my, my personal disposition, my viewpoint of life is getting really bad at this point. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm humiliated. I would come home um, and I would think to myself, how could I, how could I have created this, uh, this problem with my family? I don't know how to get out of it. Again, I'm asking for help. Nobody knows how to help me. The people that I'm asked, what I didn't realize was that the people that I was asking really didn't know, you know, they would say things yeah. like, well, David, you shouldn't have quit high school. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of get that. <laughs> now, what do I do? <laughs> but they couldn't tell me they didn't, they mm -hmm. really didn't know. So there was this one day when I went to work. I was so upset. I mean, it was just one bad thing that was happening after another. I was very, very angry. I was not treating people well. I was reprimanded twice before I even started my shift. I lost it with the, my employers and I was screaming at them in the office. It was, it was a horrible situation. And I, and I go and I start working. I was working the night shift. It was February in Chicago, it was freezing cold. And about two o'clock in the morning, it was one of those days where one thing after another just would not go right. It was going wrong, going wrong, going wrong. A whole pallet of food fell over. I was backed up and I just broke down and started crying in this trailer. I was just sobbing, literally sobbing. And I said, God, please, if there's any kind of a God, show me something, anything. I'll do whatever it takes, but please show me something because I just don't know what to do anymore. And a voice in my head, like everything got very still, very quiet. And a voice in my head said, David, change your attitude. And I thought, what is that? Mm -hmm. Like, number one, where's this voice coming from? Number two, what is an attitude? And I started to put together in my mind that I had been hearing this since I was a child, but I didn't know what it was. Um, if I would get in trouble at school, they would bring my father in. And they would say, David's a pretty bright guy. If you would just have a better attitude with his schoolwork, he would do pretty well. So I would go home. I would, get, I would get reprimanded. They would tell me I'd have to stay in my room until the next report card came out. The idea was I was supposed to study, but nobody showed me how. And they said, change your attitude, which I didn't know how to do. So I thought, if I was going to change my attitude, if I really started to take this serious, maybe there's something to this, how would I do it? And the, the, the man that I worked for, the guy who owned this company, it was the largest food importer in the United States. He started the company in his garage and he built it to this huge thing. And I thought, what's the difference between him and me? And I, and I, and I narrowed it down to three things. One was that I fig figured this guy must have really loved what he did to start this in his garage and build it to this huge company he must have really enjoyed it. And I thought, I don't, I, do, I hate what I do. Like I hated it, like viscerally hated it every day. And I thought, okay, I'm going to change. That's the first thing I'm going to change. I'm going to act like I love what I do. The second thing was that I thought he must have done really well. And I know that I was not doing well. In fact, not only was I not giving it my best every day, but I was really working to go home. I, I could not wait to get out of there and go home. In fact, I would actually frequently come up with made up illnesses, so to speak, where it would be like, if I can figure out a way not to go to work today and get paid for it, that would be fantastic. 
Um, so I said, okay, that's the next thing I'm going to change. I'm going to, I am going to give everything my very best and I'm going to figure out how to do that. And then the third thing was I recognized how terrible I was treating people. And I really love people. That was not who I was, but I didn't know. I didn't, I had no emotional maturity. I didn't know how to handle my anger. I didn't know what to do with it. And I said, I'm going to start treating people with total respect. So just prior to this, I had been trying to figure out how do I go from $20,000 a year to 40? Because I figured if I could get to 40, I could change everything. And I couldn't figure it out. Every day during my lunch break, I would sit there with a pad of paper and a pencil and a calculator. And I'm like, if, maybe if I can get this other little job over here, or if I can get nickel and dime raises over there, whatever I could do to earn money, I was, do, I was trying to do it, but nothing, nothing was changing. So I had this goal of like $40,000. So I say, okay, I'm going to stick to this attitude change for 12 months and see if it, if anything happens and I do it the next day I go to work, I am, I am trying to show up acting like I love what I do, uh, treating people with respect, like right off the bat, not even just trying it. Like I'm doing it. I'm yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Really being polite to people, please. And thank you. The whole thing. Um, and I'm learning what it means to give my best. So if I would do something like my job was basically loading food into a trailer, if I would do it and I would see that I was not doing it correctly, I would go back and do it again, no matter what the price was of doing that, which meant that it was backing other people up. Like we were, we were on this whole production line that needed to move relatively quickly. So I'm doing this. And what really blew my mind was that in 30 days, my income tripled. I went from 20,000 a year to 62,000 a year. I had a completely different opportunity show up in my life that allowed me to make this massive change really fast. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked that this happened. And so much so that I would sit on the couch with my first couple of paychecks and look at my name next to that number and I couldn't believe that I was earning that much money. But what shocked me the most was the fact that this could happen so quickly and I didn't understand how it could happen. And everybody around me was saying, David, you got lucky. You're like, don't screw this up like you've screwed everything else up. You really got lucky here. And I knew that there was more to it than that, but I didn't know what. So I thought, you know something, I am going to like read every book that I can get my hands on. I'm going to ask people, I'm going to find out what I did to change and then see if I can keep doing that to make my life better. Cause I was onto something. And that was the process. That's what started me down that road. Uh, and I spent seven years studying, going to seminars, uh, finding mentors, anybody that could explain to me and teach me how to do better. And when I was started with the company that I was at, um, the, I started as a truck driver and seven years later, I was in charge of expanding that company across the country. And that was right before I left to start my own business. And I never went back to school, uh, never took any classes. It was consistently understanding how to make myself better and start with the internal changes that I needed to make and working through what was keeping me in such a bad place. And it worked like a charm. And I thought, I love this so much. I want to teach this to other people because yeah, right. I am shocked that other people don't know this. I mean, I didn't know how it worked and, and why people were so stuck. I didn't know. And as I, excuse me, as I began to learn, I thought, I there's nothing I love more than being able to teach this to other people and watch them change. So that's how it started for me. And that's how I ended up in the business that I am. And that was 22 years ago. <laughs> Extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing that. Can, can I ask, were there parts along the way that you questioned your ability to make it work or once you'd kind of set your face like Flint and, and decide, no, I'm going to be this guy. Uh, and you were wholehearted about that. Did you find that you just kept going from strength to strength? Um, I'm, I'm curious around, you know, whether insecurity, whether some kind of nagging doubts and fears got in the way at all, or whether you found Jeez. a way to, to banish those from your life altogether. I did. Yes. Yeah, so, so I, I wouldn't say that I banished them from my life altogether, but I will, I will say that the insecurities were, they were horrific. Mm. So what was fascinating was that the opportunity for me to change jobs uh, was around me for two years. And what I learned was I couldn't see it because I was filtering everything through my pain. 
and I was filtering everything through being a victim and every, and what was wrong with the world. So I, 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 it wasn't that it wasn't there. I just couldn't see it as an opportunity. So my self-esteem had, had gotten so bad that one of the things that I was immensely grateful for was when I went to work for the new company, it was at night. And because it was at night and I was driving this truck making deliveries at night, I was under no supervision. So nobody could see me make mistakes. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm so grateful for this because I felt like at the, my former job, people were constantly watching every little mistake that I made. And I didn't get a chance to actually do it right without all this judgment. Mm. So it gave me an opportunity to kind of find myself and start to build a self-esteem and some self-reliance and some self-confidence before anybody had a chance to go, David, you screwed this up again. You screwed this up again. Because I couldn't seem to get ahead of my own shame. I mean, it was just, yeah. it was, it was really bad. So yes, in the beginning, it was really rough. Once I started to build some self-confidence, as I began to grow and the different challenges that I was taking on, I was finding new insecurities that I had, <laughs> um, new places that I needed to learn how to manage and, and, and overcome. And that never really stopped it, because every time I set myself a, a uh, a different target, a different goal, a different trajectory for growth. I had to overcome any kind of self-doubt or limitation that I had picked up as a child. Now, eventually that got better, but it took a long time. It took a lot of years to really overcome that. Yeah, uh, amazing. I, I love the distinction around you overcome one insecurity and then because you've grown your world bigger, now you've reached a new boundary condition, some new structure in your mind that says, oh, I yes. can go this far, but not that far. And then you have to go through the process again. Um, so yeah, it's it's just it's fascinating watching you learn on the go. I think that is the best place to learn, isn't it? Like you, yes. you throw yourself in the deep end, and then you got to work it out. When I was a kid, um, I was like the class clown, and I was also very talkative. Like I used to talk constantly, so much so that people started telling me that I talked too much. Right. And they started, they were calling me jabber jaw and making fun of me and that type of thing. And over a period of time, I started not to talk. I would talk if we were together quietly amongst friends, stuff like that, but not in the public or in a social situation. I started to get very introverted. While I was making these changes, I was introduced to multi level marketing. It was kind of like my first introduction to what an entrepreneur would be like. And I found myself attracted to it and I started to get involved in it. And as I did it, uh, one of the things that they teach you is that you have to go talk to people that you don't know. And when I started to do it, I found out that I couldn't. I literally would approach somebody and then turn around and start to walk the other way because I, I would just shut down inside. So I thought if I'm ever going to own my own business and be successful, I'm going to have to learn how to get over this. So I, I set a goal for myself every day, every person that I would come in contact with that I did not previously know, every new person, maybe I would go into a gas station to, to purchase some gas and have to go up to the counter to pay for it. I would force myself to have a conversation, to learn how to have a conversation beyond just the casual politeness of saying, hello, thank you, how's your day? But really digging into a person, showing interest in an individual. And I had to push myself to do it. There were many times where I would literally forget what to say and have to turn around and walk out of the building. Mm -hmm. But I, I made a commitment to do it every day. And I taught myself how to re-engage and have a conversation with anybody at any time. So I was that insecure that, that I would be so embarrassed or shut down that I couldn't overcome it in the moment and literally have to walk out of the store. Amazing. Do you think that a big part of overcoming insecurity is in what you've described the process of going, what if I was to go face the thing that I'm most afraid of and incrementally watch myself make changes and therefore see that I'm stronger than I think rather than I'm weaker than I'm think than I think is that kind of how you conceptualize this process of building confidence? Yes, that is exactly how. And I heard the reason that I did that was because in 1993, I came home in the middle of the night from work. My wife had uh, made me some supper. It was in the refrigerator, take it out, put it in the microwave type of thing. And I turn on the television and there's Tony Robbins, uh, young Tony Robbins starting his first infomercial. And I, I, that's another long story, but I ended up buying his personal power tapes that he had. 
And I remember him saying that, you, you know, he was so inspirational, especially back then, like he was young and vibrant and, and just full of energy. And, and he would say that you, you could do anything that you put your mind to if you're willing to go beyond the thing that scares you or go beyond the place that you stop. And I kept thinking, where do I stop? Right. So where would I actually start to do something and then have a conversation with myself where I would totally turn around, break my word, break my commitment and go the other way. And I decided I'm going to force myself to go beyond that, no matter how uncomfortable it is, but no matter how um, uh, like uncoordinated it seems. Right. Like it was very, very it was not, this was not like a polished conversation. It was me struggling to find any kind of word or dialogue to be able to engage with a person. So I recognized that if I stuck with it, based on what Tony had said at the time, was that you would find the next level within the process if you didn't give up. And of course, that was true. The more I kept doing it, the more I kept finding the next level, the next thing to say, the next conversation to have, you know, it just one thing led to another as long as I didn't give up. Um, it must have been extraordinary that moment in time seeing Tony Robbins for the first time, you know, because he 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 was a force of nature. Um, yeah. I I uh, at a garage sale maybe maybe five years ago stumbled across an unopened um, set of CDs, Personal Power, Tony Robbins, yeah. and and this like had like ten dollars on it. I thought I bet she paid you know, hundreds of dollars for that. And I, I had to have it. And and just going through his back catalogue of his early stuff, just being astounded at it, it must have been an extraordinary time because uh, he was probably one of the first people to get up and just say, do you know what? You, you can turn this around. You can make a change. And he was so wholehearted about it and such a big character physically and uh, in every way, spiritually, emotionally. Um, can you talk us through just watching that force of nature kind of, um, start to explode in the American scene and then how that impacted you as you started to learn his stuff. Yeah. So I'll, so I'll tell you the story. So I come home that night, I, I turn on the television, I'm having a bite to eat and Tony Robbins is on there. And the, the, the infomercial was probably about 20 minutes long and I'm watching and I'm listening to it. And I'm thinking, this guy's talking about everything that I want in life. How does he know this? And at the, of course, then, you know, towards the end of it, they say, you dial this 800 number, it's, it's three easy payments of $167 or whatever it was. And I thought, I've got to do this, but I was scared to death to spend the money. So the first night, I did nothing. I just watched the infomercial over and over and over again until about 530 in the morning, and then I went to bed. The second night I came home, I wasn't even thinking about it, actually. I did the same routine every night. I got a bite to eat, sit down in a recliner, turn on the television. There he is again. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this guy is talking. This is exactly what I want. If this, he, if he knows what he's talking about, like my whole life could change. Mm. So I decide I get up, I get my wallet off the kitchen counter. I pull out my credit card. And I mean, money was really tight back then. So $167 was like the world. And I, I dialed the number, you know, this is when the phone hung on the wall, right? You know, <laughs> dial the number, pick up the phone. And when the operator answered, I was so scared. I hung up <laughs> and I couldn't make the purchase. Third night, I come back, do it again. And I thought I had to literally have this conversation to kind of con myself into it. I thought, what if he's a con man? Like, yeah. what if this is just total BS, right? Like, I don't, you know, you hear about that kind of stuff all the time. And I thought, look, it's only $167. If it doesn't work, it's it's no big deal. It's not, it's not going to kill you. But if it does work, if you could learn anything from this guy, and I was really searching at the time. You see, back then, there was no Google, right? There was no internet. I literally would go to the bookstore, go to the library to try to find books. And I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know there, I didn't know there was a self-help section and there really wasn't back then, not the way that it is today anyway. So I was looking for biographies and stuff to read. Anyway, I buy the personal power tapes and I really get into them. What I did, and they were cassette tapes. So I got all the music out of my car. Um, I used to have to drive a hundred miles to work one way. So it was significant. I turned my car into a, a learning center. It was my library 
And that's how I, be, how I began to learn. Well, shortly after I bought these tapes, I, his marketing kicked in and I actually got a letter and I got a, another cassette tape of him talking about this invitation to go to one of his live seminars. And it was in, I would lived in Chicago. This was in Columbus, Ohio. It was December when I got the marketing information and the, and the, and the event was in February. It was $3,600. And I was like, whoa, $3,600. Well, one of the things that I had done prior to this was I had set a goal for myself. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted my own fishing boat. Like that's another whole story. We couldn't afford one when I was a kid. It was a goal. So as soon as I started making a little bit of money, I set this goal. I bought this boat and I had just paid it off. I'm standing in the kitchen with my wife and I'm like, more than anything in my life, I want to go to this seminar. I want to see what else I can learn from this guy. And she said, well, you can go if you can come up with $3,600, but I don't know how we're going to get that much money by February. It's December. Like that's the moon for us. And I'm drinking up a cup of coffee and I'm looking out the window and there's my boat sitting there. And it's a brand new boat. I had just paid it off. And I thought, no way, no way. And I'm like, it just dawned on me. There's my $3,600. Am I willing to sacrifice this this thing that you just did in order to be able to go. And at first, my, my, my inner child was screaming, going, are you crazy that you've wanted this your whole life? You just got it. You're going to sell it. And I thought, you know something, if I can ever figure out what I'm doing, I could buy any boat that I want. So I sold it that week and I went to the, I went to the seminar. And when I went to the seminar and Tony came out on stage, my first thought was, how cool would it be able to do that for a living? But in the moment, I, I just couldn't take that in. So I shut that idea off, right? Turns out seven years later, that's exactly what I would be doing for a living. But I didn't know that at the time. And I, was, I realized that there was, I was in this process of saying yes to goals and something would come in and it would grow and then it would take me to the next level and the next level and the next level. But the thing was, was that if I hadn't have bought those tapes that night, I don't think I'd be here today because it, it was exactly how everything had to happen in my life for, for everything to change. So it was, it, I mean, it's, I'm really proud of the story. And I'm, I'm also very transparent about the fact that I was shaking on that yeah. phone to actually spend that money, but it changed everything. It totally changed everything for me. Extraordinary. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, you're I welcome. I read also that you had a, a near death experience um, earlier on as well. I imagine that was another big defining moment that, that shaped you. Can you tell us the impact that had on you and, and how that yeah. contributed to your work? <clears throat> that was a few years before it actually happened in September of 1989. I was, uh, uh, my son had just was born in June and this was in September and we, my wife and I were very exhausted. He was a little bit ill when he was first born and we had not gotten much sleep. We went on a boat with, uh, with my, my mom, my stepdad, my aunt, my uncle, just to get away for the day and, and water ski it was on the Illinois river. I got separated from the boat and I got sucked through a dam. And I was one of only two people at that time that had ever gone through there that lived. And the guy, the other guy that went through the year before me, he ended up to be a paraplegic. And this dam was so dangerous that people would go through every year and get killed. They had no way, if you're like, if your boat broke down and you were stuck in the current, there was no way for you not to go through this dam. Like it was run by the Army Corps of Engineers. There was no way to get out of the, out of the current. So anyway, I, got, I went through this thing and lived. I, I broke my back and I had some other injuries, but nothing you know, that, that was gonna maim me forever. And what it did though, was that I realized that day that life is short. And we don't know how long we actually have. And up until that point, I had no urgency to do anything. That gave me urgency. It also said, it also gave me the belief. I created the meaning that I was here for a reason. I didn't know why, but I thought if I lived through this, there must be a reason that I lived through this. <clears throat> because so many people had died before me going through this. So it gave me some, it gave me some meaning, it gave me some focus. Uh, and, it, and it helped me realize that if I'm ever going to do something, I need to do it now. And I recognize that throughout my life, 
I had a, a little bit more of a sense of urgency to pull the trigger and say yes with things than most of the people that were around me. And I think it was the caused by the fact that I know that I'm not going to be here forever. So if I have the opportunity now, there's a reason for it. And I need to say yes to the opportunity and, and really give it the best that I can. Yeah. Amazing. Um, okay. So fast forward into starting your own business and actually replicating something you'd seen in Tony Robbins and going, okay, I'm going to be someone who helps people and helps people grow and change. Can you tell us about the, the, the inception of that company and, and some of the, the experiences around what you learned around empowering other people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the, in the mid nineties, around 1995, 96, when I was involved with this network marketing company, uh, one of the people that was doing a tremendous amount of work with that company and the folks that were involved with it was Bob Proctor. And uh, he was, he was always speaking for the company. His wife was a, a Royal diamond distributor with this company and I started to learn from him. I didn't even know who he was at the time. And somebody said, have you ever heard of this guy? And I said, no. And they gave me a couple of cassette tapes called Bob Proctor Live in Orlando, I think, if I remember right. Anyway, I was listening to them. And Bob filled in a big part of the puzzle for me that, I, that, I was, that was a question that nobody else was fulfilling, not even Tony. And that was, how does the spiritual aspect actually come together with the self-improvement part, the success part. I had major conflicts uh, with that in my life because of how I was raised and being raised Catholic. So he was answering those questions. And I thought, I have got to work with this guy. Like, this is the guy that's going to be my mentor. So I worked really hard to try to get myself into that position. And in the late nineties, I got an opportunity. He said, when he first started doing this, actually, I was in the very first group of people that he was selling facilitatorships for. He would train you to teach his seminar. You would buy the rights to be able to do that. And then that's how you would start in the business. So that's how I started. And I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, so that was like in 1999. And I went and I got trained by him. Uh, and then I started doing seminars based on what he taught me. So, so what was really cool about this was I had, I had so much drive that I was putting more people in, the, in my seminars that he had putting in his seminars in his business. So a couple of things came out of that. One, he asked me to come train his facilitators on how to sell because they were not doing well at all. So I did that. And then after a short period of time, he said, why don't we start a business together? And we started our own seminar company I got to travel with him around the world and we would speak together and then we would do seminars. We would sell seminars and do them. And, and I, I mean, we worked together for five, six years and it was the best education that I've ever had. I got a business education. I got a seminar education. I got him as my mentor. Um, it was all condensed like into this package. And then, and then a few years after we did that, it was like, okay, it's time to go on, on your own and really just do your own thing. So I created all my own material, my own seminars. And it, it, you know, it, I was, and then I was really off on my own after, after that. But it was a phenomenal experience. I mean, really, when I look at who changed my life the most, it was Proctor. I would not be where I am today without his mentorship and, and uh uh, the love and care that he showed for me back in those days. Extraordinary. Would you be able to summarize um, the the missing piece around the spirituality and success? Is there a way that you could describe what he added that Tony didn't uh, for the audience? Well, I think, so the first thing that he added was the, was the idea that, that there was not a difference between the spiritual and the physical, that it was actually one. And what he did was he taught, and he still does, um, he taught you how to use the spiritual principles that you were learning, depending like whatever religion you were in, he would teach people of all religions. And he would say, listen, I'm not here to change your religion. I'm here to teach you how to use it. Mm -hmm. So it was coming from the idea of a universal and a spiritual principle and how do you think? What are, you, what are your thoughts for? How do you use your thoughts? How do you use your emotions? And how does that then move into the actions of what you're doing? So the thing that made the most sense to me was that everybody had a purpose. And it was a spiritual purpose first, 
um, literally coming to fruition in a, at a, on a physical level and that everybody, they're like part of our job would be to find out what is your purpose. If you think about it, every form of life does not question what its purpose is, except for human beings. Mm -hmm. Most human beings don't even realize they have one. So if you can understand how to find out what your purpose is and then how to use it based on spiritual or universal laws, success is not something that happens by luck. It happens by design. And I had no idea that that was even possible. I mean, I was raised in a, in a, with the idea that you had to be lucky or you had to know someone or you had to be a little dishonest <laughs> to, to be really successful. I mean, that was true. That's how I was raised. Yeah, sure. So when he brought when he brought the spiritual piece in, I realized that it was all part of the same thing and that there were actually principles that you could use from a point of understanding to be successful. And it started with understanding where who you were spiritually and who you are physically and how those two things interconnect and manifest into the physical world as your life or the success that you want or a business or a relationship, whatever it might be. Yeah, that, that's extraordinary. It's yeah. incorporating it as what yeah. it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, magnificent. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, so many tangents to take. I, I'm just, I've got to go back and, and pick up something that you said around um, turning your car into a learning center. Um, yeah. that, that idea there seems to be something in common uh, for people who have succeeded in life, they they seem to have used their car as a university. They they seem to have gone right. Well, here is some dead time where I'm traveling. How could I maximize this? Well, there is resources out there. People have got content, so how could I get that? And, and I think, you know, back then it was tapes in your in your cassette player. Right now, you know, there is just a, a an unlimited source of extraordinary content. That seems to be to be a no brainer today. If, if you're not using your car as a university, I'm like, where, how did you miss that? That was a thing that, yeah. that seems to be yeah. 101 for self-improvement. Get some stuff happening when you drive in your ears. Yeah. I went to Honda Civic University is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah extraordinary um were there any other key books along the way that have been instrumental in your journey books that maybe you still recommend to other people well so so i mean think and grow rich was a was a staple because it was a proctor really introduced it to me um he also introduced me to uh, um, um earl nightingale lead the field and that type of stuff but there was a book that that i i picked up around 1996 97 that it, it really shifted something inside of me like no other book had at that time. And that was The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. And what it did for me was that in my body, in my mind, in the way that I felt, it was almost like I could feel that the universe operated in a certain way that supported the idea of life. But I couldn't conceptualize it. I did not have like an intellectual picture of it at the time. And I had heard about this book for a while. I, for some weird reason, I thought it was a book on economics. I didn't know what it was. Eventually I got my hands on it and I sat down. My family had actually gone out for the day and I sat down on a Saturday afternoon and, and read this book and I, and I broke into tears when I was reading it. Because the way Waddles wrote that book, he put it in an order that made sense to my mind. Mm. And it was like, all of a sudden, I had a picture on what I already knew was true, but I couldn't seem to get it in the proper order. And that book put it in the proper order. So that book, that it moved me miles ahead very, very quickly, because now I had... Uh, an image or a conceptualization of what was going on. And I could and I could use it better. I could also explain it better. And that's when I actually started uh, coaching or mentoring people that would just ask me for advice. Because one of the weird things that happened was as people saw me becoming more and more successful, they would kind of grab me and pull me on the side. And they're like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, I can't believe this. You were this guy a few years ago that, that quit school and you weren't doing nothing. And now you're making all this money and you've got all this opportunity and everything's what is actually going on. 
So I started saying to them, here, do this, do this, do this, or recommend a few books, whatever. I wasn't charging anything. Or, and I was like, just trying to help people at the time. And the people that would actually take it serious and do it, you'd watch their lives change relatively rapidly. So I thought, that's really fascinating. And I loved it. Like, there was a love and a passion for being able to do that. And I thought to myself, wow, if I could ever do that for a living, that would be absolutely phenomenal. And of course that came a couple of years later, but to the answer your question, the science of getting rich was the book that moved me ahead first. There's been a lot of books since, but that was the first one that really did something for me. Mm, wow. Okay. Thank you. I haven't even heard of that book. So that's straight on the list. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was written in 1911. <laughs> Is that right? Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I do love the people who said it first and said it best, the, the books that have stood the test of time that we all grow from and um, glean from. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely find that out. Um, so tell us, tell us, you know, in, in today's world, the, the work that you're doing with people around empowering them and helping them with their mindset and their beliefs about who they are. Can you tell us um, what, what your work's like today and who you get to work with? Yeah, so that's a that's a really great question. When I when I first started, I was working with anybody. I was just trying to help everybody and anybody. And then I had to learn about business um, and to put it into a business and what that actually looked like. And I found that I really loved uh, uh, entrepreneurialism. I think I had a, a, a pension for it. I I loved it. I loved the people. I loved the energy. And I started focusing on individuals that were very stuck in their business because of their mindset. And I realized that with just a few little tweaks with most people, I could really help them move it along pretty quick. So most of the people that we work with today are business owners mm -hmm. um, and, and really pretty well-established business owners. So we help them with a lot of mindset stuff that keeps them stuck either in how they're progressing in their business, whether it's, maybe it's something that's going on in the craziness of the world right now, or maybe they're a little lost in their life for what it is that they want to do. We do work with people in many different areas, but primarily it's business people that we work with. Um, and we help them get really in tune with what do they want in their heart? The first idea for me is not how much money they're making. It's, are you happy, right? Do you wake up every morning and you're really happy? Like, is the idea I get to do this or do you wake up and go, oh, hell, I have to do this. You know, I think we should wake up and go, this is an amazing life. Mm. I really get to do this. And I get to do something that makes a difference in the life of somebody else. So that's, you know, that is the, that is the premise of where the company uh, starts. Of course, we have a podcast that reaches people of all different kinds of backgrounds. So we're able to help people in, in, in many other areas. But my personal work day to day, when I'm actually working with people, it's usually business people. Some political people, but usually, usually sure. people. Uh, I wonder if those early lessons you learned around attitude, you know, living like you love this work, you know, respecting people beautifully and, you know, showing up and doing your best. I wonder if those still infiltrate some of the key lessons that you bring when people are stuck in their own mindset and attitude. I think so. And I think one of the reasons is, is because, so many people are living lives that they think they have to live mm -hmm. and they don't, but nobody has ever told them that they don't. Mm -hmm. We live in a society that reinforces what you're told to do, not what you want to do. And I come from the place of let's find out what you want to do. And, and I can show you how to live that way by changing your thinking, but let's focus on what it is that you really want, not what you think you have to do. That is no way to spend a life in my mind. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, okay. So, you know, the insecurity project focuses on people who get stuck in specifically in their own belief that perhaps they don't deserve to get what they want, or they're not good enough to get what they want. So uh, what would you say to those people who are stuck there? What mindset adjustments would you direct them to make? First thing that I would ask them to start to work on understanding is that the universe doesn't hold anything back from you. So the, the universe is created in a way where it supports life moving forward on a consistent basis. We call that the principle of more life. Um, you know, life is always giving you, or the universe is always giving you the next thing to be able to move forward. If you can't see it, if you're stuck, the first question I ask is, what are you resisting being, doing, or having uh, in your own mind? 
And of course, most people don't really know what that is at first. They have to sit down and think about it, or I'll walk them through it. But the truth is, is that if we are stuck, it's not because there's something out in the world that is keeping us stuck. It's because we're not recognizing something in our own consciousness that would allow us to step forward. Just like when I was on the, when I was on the forklift, I could not see this opportunity that was around me for two years that allowed me to triple my income. What allowed me to see it was as I changed my attitude, it changed my perception. And as my perception changed, I saw something that I didn't want anything to do with now become something that was an opportunity that would, that would literally triple my income in a month. And I was able to take advantage of that. And I think based on the way that people are mostly raised with the idea of how am I safe and secure, like first and foremost, what keeps me safe and secure in life so that I can take care of my family, it does not give them the intellectual liberation to see things from an opportunistic standpoint where they literally could live any way that they want to if they could only see and recognize the opportunity to be able to step into it. So I ask a person, what are you resisting? And get them thinking along those lines first. That's extraordinary. Just the universe does not hold anything back from you. The law of more life. That's that's how yeah. you call Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, where can people find out more about you, David, if they want to understand more about your work? Uh, where, where's the best place for them to go looking? So there's, there's two places. The first one is, is any podcast channel, the Successful Mind podcast. Um, there's nothing that I teach privately that I don't teach in that podcast from mm -hmm. uh, a general knowledge perspective. So a person can go there and get a really well-rounded education for their own thinking and they could work themselves. If they want to know more about what we do privately, it's davidnagel.com. Uh, and, our, and all of our information is there, you know, and we're on all the social media channels and, you know, any place that your favorite podcasts are, are being uh, put out there, we're there. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Uh, is there anything we've missed, anything that you would like to add, uh, anything that you haven't said yet that you think could be a great uh, addition to this conversation that's already covered some extraordinary things? The one thing that I would say is that we are in an unprecedented time of change. And how that affects you has a lot to do with how you think about it. So before you make any decision, um, uh, because you're, you're evaluating things from one perspective, make sure that you get a real, uh, learn to think first, hmm. right? Learn to think first and then make a decision. So if you go to the podcast, it'll give you some really different ideas about how to think for, about things, because really opportunity is based on your perception to see things in a different light. And it's, it's all there. You just have to be able to see it. It's a fantastic place to leave the conversation. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been very enjoyable and I've taken so wow. many insights. I'm, I'm sure the audience has as well. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor.